founder and CEO of Shift Forward. Uh, Shift Forward is a, is a startup and we have a marketing technology stack and we help large organizations collect data about their consumers, their users, and use them for marketing activities or for revenue uh, opportunities. And some of them are telcos, uh, big data owners like Bertelsmann in Germany, and as well media players, but usually of the very large size. Now, I know people have been talking about what's very large and what's an elephant. I'm gonna give you my take and from my personal experience on dealing in this market and doing inside sales in a way that doesn't really require or hasn't been required in hiring uh, specialized salespeople, okay? Because a lot of the times it's really, really hard and very expensive to do so. So this is the start of trying to sell to large companies experience. So what is an elephant? An elephant is a, is a large company, right? Um, but a company isn't just a collection of people. Uh, in fact, they're not people, they're persons. And there's a difference. They have personalities, they're individuals, and everyone has their wishes, their goals, their objectives, their career paths, and that cannot be neglected. So when you think about what I thought about selling to a large company, I realized I wasn't selling to a large company. I'm selling to specific people that have specific ideas and objectives in their lives. Okay? That's something I've learned very hard. But also, they're very well structured. It's another thing, it's really hard to find a large organization that isn't somewhat structured. Um, when they're not, and they're very flat, I think you can treat them as a small company. So that the rest of my talk here doesn't apply to them. But to the large organizations who are heavily structured, you've got to learn how structures work. I had to learn that revenue and legal were very different people. And when I was talking to legal, I had to put on a different hat. Then I'm talking to people that are in charge of revenue, which is different from the people who are in charge of IT, and people who are in charge of HR, and you know it can get very complicated. And we have to keep that in mind, and I've learned also the very hard way that we have to have different voices and different even terms when talking to different people. And they also follow very strict processes. You know, if you find InfraSpeak and you think, oh, this is really cool, you can just sign up and you know you make the call. Uh, you know, why show of hands? Who's here in a startup that is selling or trying to sell to large organizations? Okay, how many of you have been successful at selling to at least one large organization? Okay, and how many of you have been able to replicate the process, the same process, and scale it up? Okay. <laughs> and you can see why you got to see you know the follow-up round now. So it's hard because there isn't a, a script that you can just go on and do the same thing because there are different people and different processes for everyone. Um, so, but the process is there and it takes a long time. So one of my experiences with a, a, a large uh, organization in the telecommunication space, uh, US space, it took us longer to get the contract signed than it did us to actually run the proof of concept to them. We were done with the proof of concept. We delivered everything we had to, and the contract was inside, yeah. Because legal wasn't really sure about things, and IT had to take an eye on things, and security, and privacy, and it was a nightmare. It took us two years from the first time we spoke that they said, yes, we're gonna go with you. And eight months in, they told me, listen, Paolo, you are now gonna go through our recruitment process. We tried to get you out of it, but we couldn't. So I'm really sorry to do this to you, but it's gonna be a long, long way, but don't worry, we will get there in the end, I will help you, but it will take a long time. And from that moment on, it took over a year to get things signed, it was, it was crazy. And this isn't a, a, you know, a one-time thing, it happened again and again in different organizations. <laughs> So that's why they're elephants, right? They're, they're big, they're strong, they can pay well. Um, they're very resistant to changes in, in the marketplace, but they're very stubborn, very risk averse. You know, Everything, the reason we, why it took so long was because no one wanted to lose their job, right? Legal did not want to say, oh, it's okay. 
we'll sign off with a startup base in Porto to handle our data to. They're not going to do that. They had to have everyone check to make sure that if something went wrong, it was not their fault. That's all really that, that really matters. And they're doing it right. That's how, that's how they have to be. Um, because otherwise, everyone would be running off in different directions. And it wouldn't be one organization. You would just be you know, clusters of small people trying to go and do their own thing. That doesn't work. So we have to understand the beast before we try to tackle it. I mean, that's our experience. So what about the startups? Well, we're the small guys, right? And, uh, and the elephants are afraid of mice. I don't know if you know the fable, but that's what they say. And the reason is, well, they're afraid that the mice is gonna get crushed. You know, if even the elephant moves in the wrong place, they will crush it. They're afraid of that. They're afraid you're gonna disappear. They're afraid you're not gonna be there next year when they're gonna do the budget for next year. That's their problems. It's not about the quality of the product many times. It's not about if you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. It's about are you even you know, gonna be around next year? Yes, they also are afraid that you can't deliver because they don't know you. You're a small guy. And we're you know, in, this, in this room likely from a different country. And they're also afraid that you get up their trunk. That's actually a myth, but uh, I think the comparison here is they're afraid you do sometimes, they're afraid you do <coughs> a job too well, but then they have to buy you out because otherwise they're going to look really bad because they're gonna do their job many times. And that's something we have to consider. In my case, that happened when we were trying to sell our product to the IT department. And even though it was a marketing product, we were trying to sell it to the CTOs and the IT people, and we failed miserably. And the reason we failed was because they were realizing they were trying to, trying to do the same thing, but weren't really achieving it. And they were afraid that if they were buying us, they have two problems. One, they'll have to throw everything out that they have been doing so far. And of course, you know that would be the logical way, but that would just be saying that they were just bad at their job. And second, they were afraid that if you go away, they'll lose their core business. So eventually you had to move, stop selling to IT, and start selling to someone else. So, can they be your friends? In my experience, yes. But also, if you have other types of customers, if you have rabbits and deer and all of those other guys, to sell to first, do that. If there's any chance you're gonna to sell to anyone else but a large organization, my personal experience, if I was doing this again, I would not sell it to them directly if I had a choice. But if elephants really are your target market, and then you have to ask yourselves, and this is a question I ask myself many times, do they have an option? Can they do this themselves? Can they buy another company to do it for them? It doesn't matter for how much. Can they build it in-house? Can they find a large organization that does a worse job, but at least they say they do the same thing? Because if it's a yes, it's going to be really hard to sell to them. And the worst part is they're not gonna tell you. They're not gonna say, look, Paolo, this is the reason why we're not gonna buy from you. No, they're gonna say, look, I'm gonna check out with my manager, my boss, we're gonna have a meeting about a meeting next week to set up a call with the CEO. And you're gonna spend a year before you even realize they're not gonna buy from you. They're just gonna you know, take it as much as they can, take it a, as much time as they can because they need alternatives. And he will do the same thing, so I'm not judging them. Just a reality. Um, you know, one, had one, one example that happened to us was exactly this sort of situation. And in the end, we discovered that this large organization ended up acquiring a startup for like 30 million or something. And they didn't even tell us anything. And then even after doing that, they were telling us, oh, well, no, that's nothing to do with our conversation. And of course it was. And they were doing exactly what we were pitching them to. Uh, but it's a hard lesson. Um, and so if, you, you have to ask yourself, do they really, really need you? And if the answer is yes, and you can deliver, then price doesn't really matter. 
Because by the time they realize there's a need, by the time they realize you're the solution, you have to tell them two things. You're up for a sale and it's gonna be very expensive. And then and, and expensive can mean anything. You know, our our products we will not sell it to them under a hundred thousand a year. And, and that's in euros, so one hundred and thirty thousand dollars a year minimum. And it can go up to millions. Because anything below that, after we've gone through all this process, all the sales, all the years, you cannot sell it any cheaper. It doesn't matter how much it costs to develop the product. It's just too intensive. And so I've learned a few things, and I've I think I've learned a few things uh, in this process that I would like to share with you on small tips on how to improve your odds. Because the odds are not in our favor when you're selling to large organizations, as you've probably already realized, because only one person was successful here at replicating a, a sales model for large organizations. So I would say, first, trust is the biggest problem, right? They were afraid they're gonna get crushed. So how about trying to raise that trust in them? So what we've done is <coughs> understood who in those organizations really matter because you're not gonna try to raise trust in 20,000 people. You know, one of our clients has 120,000 employees, right? So you have to think who are the people that really matter and where are they and who are, where are they going? So we, we, in our case, we have, we've identified two types of people. One is the, the, the business guy. That's the guy responsible for revenue or improving efficiency of their marketing budgets. And then we have the IT guy. So that's the guy the business guy calls and say, hey, does this make sense? Can we integrate? Can we, you know, how long do you think it will take? Is there a problem with security here? So we have clearly identified these two people. And we went out and understood what events they attended, what Twitter feeds they were following, and have in our marketing uh, activities, content and a view to understand that they're gonna read this. They're gonna search for it on Google. They're gonna search for, you know, what is the private solution to host my data for marketing activities? Are, is Shift Forward a reliable company? That sort of thing, we understand they're gonna do that. So on a low budget, try to get them to read the content we think is gonna raise trust in ourselves. So for example, GDPR, big topic, right? No one understands what GDPR is. And so we try to go out and we put ourselves up for speaking slots in larger events, sometimes uh, you know, always up, not in Portugal, uh, because we know they're not gonna go and see it, but they're gonna see our name listed on the speaker's notes, on the speaker's list. And that's what it takes for them to realize, shift forward, oh, they know about this, cool. They're talking about it, they have to know about it, right? Not really, but that's yeah. the point. And create, sorry, creating a fear of missing out. So telling, telling them that their competitors, of course they were talking to them, and of course they're, they're very close to signing. But I, you know, as a startup, I don't have the resources to serve both of you. I can only serve one client at a time, because I'm small. And so, best I can do is I'm gonna serve whoever signs up first. In my view, in my view of competitive. And I'll just leave it at that. And that works <laughs> extremely well. Especially if there's someone else from your network, and that's gonna be my next thing. Um, from, my, from, my, from your network, I can tell them the same thing, and the same story, and they're gonna be thinking, oh God, I'm really gonna look really bad if my competitor is signing up with these guys, and I'm gonna tell my boss, then, I've been talking to them, but you know, I didn't really do it. So that's, that's, that's very powerful, that's very uh, strong in my experience so far. The other thing we've been doing you know, somewhat successfully is trying to be alone in, in the race. So when someone um, talks to us, when we talk out to someone, we try to think who else is pitching the same thing. And so in our product, the obvious scenario would be we would go out to the marketing department and tell them, you can do your job better if you use our tool instead of, and then you can think about you know, large organizations like Salesforce, IBM, Adobe. We're gonna fail at that, because they don't care. No one ever got fired for hiring IBM, right? So it does not do that. So what did we do? We went to the revenue people, we went to the business people who were in, responsible for increasing revenue. Adobe and other guys, they're somewhat talking to them, but they're not really there. And so when we were in that race, 
we were much much more isolated than anyone else. And that's just an example. I've been actually uh, looking for other examples, and I've been thinking about some of the companies here and think, look, if you you know if you if you have a software for developers, um, if you go out to a developer instead of the CTO, you know, like selling from bottom up, that may be a lot more effective. Even if it's a big ticket, the developers will pay for it. But it will push it. You know, Slack is a good example of that. Another example is if you have an HR software or software to look after your employees. You may think HR is the department I go to, but then everyone else is going to go there, right? There's another way. So think about customer support. Think about if your employees are happier, who benefits from it? So customer support, customer service is gonna get a better job done if their own staff is happier. So maybe try to sell to them instead. <coughs> Because no one is. And another angle of this is going to people other one everyone else is afraid of. So call the CEO. Now that's like no one knows. I, I actually did something not to the CEO, I did it to the CTO of a large media company in the US. And I did it in a in an interesting way. Uh, which is my next slide. Which was saying, listen, um, I I'm starting this project out, I've, I've got a product. I think it will be really good for you. Uh, I just want your opinion. If you have 10 minutes, I just want to call, have a chat. You tell me what you think. You know, you've started the company before. I looked it up on LinkedIn, I knew that. And so, you know, your advice would be precious. It was in San Francisco, so I set up a time saying, look, this time, this day, he replied to me within 10 minutes. This is an organization, not very large, but over 3,000 people. So he replied to me within 10 minutes saying, absolutely, awesome. But more than that, we're actually in the procurement process for a solution like that. I'm glad you emailed me because we're already halfway through and we're not very happy with everything so far. I'm gonna hand you over to the person who's doing that procurement. But by the time I got in touch with the person from procurement, that person already knew this was a lead coming from the CTO. It is not just another vendor. This is the CTO saying, look at this guy and really hear what he's saying. And that made a difference. We signed a contract, by the way. In the end, that took another year and a half. And in fact, I think only three years later, we'd be going to production. But that doesn't matter. We were invoicing right closely afterwards, which is another very important point. Everyone on the organizations was going to try to push invoicing further down the line, where I stick out in the contract stating, look, I'm going to give you one month free. And you can cancel anytime you want within the first month. But I will not give you anything for free until you sign the contract. So I force, you know, that long process. During that long process, I'm only gonna do anything else but the process until you sign. So that shows commitment from their side. And I'm not gonna put my developers and engineers putting anything until you sign the contract. That's all I ask. And then I'll give you a month free. And you can cancel. It's weird because the reaction is a mixed feelings because they, they're not expecting that. They're expecting me just to throw everything away and just do everything they say. But again, going back to the previous slides, they don't, don't really have an alternative. Because if they did, they wouldn't come with me anyway. And I know that. So we are in a very strong position. Of course, there's always a limit and all that. But I know they don't have a real alternative. And that, is, that's, that's, that goes a long way. So in this case, I wasn't being the expert, I was asking for advice, uh, but some of the stuff I do to get closer to the people in large organizations is to help them out. I'm not selling, I'm not trying to sell. I'm just saying, hey, did you know that mobile advertising is growing 30% a year and that the telecommunication companies in the world are starting to do new monetization strategies and that the world is gonna be divided between Facebook, Google, and everyone else, and that you may have a play in that, and maybe this is the play. Have you thought about this? Is this something you'd like to talk about? And actually, people say yes. Oh, that's fascinating, help me out. And I go in and try to help them. And by helping them, I'm saying, I'm helping them with business cases. By trying to give them a view of the industry, they don't have just by themselves. They'll have to do a lot of work to understand it. Sometimes it's about technology. So it's like, how do cookies work? How do, how does mobile advertising, what's the margins like, really? 
how, who's making the money? And I've been doing this with investors, very large investment groups, actually, um, just as consulting. This is actually because of our consulting background. We started the company as consultants, but we still do that when it's relevant. So investors call me up and go, oh, Paolo, we're thinking about buying this company for one billion, and we really need your help in understanding how this thing works, how does RTV work, really, and what do you think the margins are gonna be in five years' time, and where's this all going? And I would normally say, I'm, I can't do that, I'm, I don't do services anymore. But I, of course I go in and talk to them, because I know any of the companies in their portfolio, if there's anyone who could be my client, I'm gonna ask them later, oh, by the way, do you think now that our product could be interesting for one of your companies? Could you could do me an introduction? Now, can you imagine the CEO of a large organization being told by their own investor, you know, large investor, that they should be talking to us? That's like all the trust up there, right? That's, that's a very, that was very effective so far. And in doing this, we also created a board of advisors in the process. So we have people with stock options and, and a vested interest in our company out there in the world, they're not necessarily selling, but they have their ears open. And they know that if there's something that we can help, they're gonna put on in for it. And that has been the source of 80% of our leads, to be very honest, on the large organizations. That, that's, that's very key. This is, if anything else, I would say this is for me would be number one. And this is something you can take on from one job role to another company, to another company, because people in large organizations also move around. So by the time, so it's not a waste of time, even if they quit their job, because one year later, they're gonna be in even a bigger company, and they're gonna be your next client. And that's exactly what's been happening to us. Another interesting one is, is uh, pretending you're something you're not, so shape-shifting. Not trying to look bigger than you are, that also works, but trying to fit into something are, they are used to buying. So I'll give you two examples from my experience. We were trying to sell a technology license and because it was a technology license for an innovative product, it had to go through this new way of buying that they have for that sort of thing. But they already had approved budgets for hosting and for development hours. That was already done. They already had the budget for the year. That's how they worked. They didn't have the budget for innovative licensing fees. So what we had to do was in the contract say, okay, this is the terms and conditions. But by the way, our invoicing and the way we're selling this is a minimum of 200 development hours a month and 50 hours of support. The license is free, but you have to pay for support the licensing hour and, and support hours. And that was a deal done. But for the next year, now they have the budget for the technology fee and they move the contract. But that, that made the difference, not necessarily on just selling, but it made the difference on how early were we gonna get the revenue. And in this case, it was almost a year earlier that we were gonna get the revenue. That was, that was, I mean, I didn't learn this myself. It was actually the person on the company who told me this. He said, hey, don't, don't show me, I've never seen this. You show me a proposal that says, are you gonna charge me for hosting and development hours? Because then I can sign it off. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so that's Mickey Mouse there. Something they are familiar with and they already have approved budgets for. That also works really well in advertising. I don't know if anyone is very deep in online advertising, but one of the business models that is very successful are ad networks. So you're trying to sell your product as a technology platform and you end up selling ads. Because everyone has a budget for ads and everyone can spend 10% of their own budget for testing new things. Because even if it doesn't work, no one cares. Well, they do care, but not much. But if it's a new marketing platform, they're not gonna be doing anything. So a lot of the ad networks aren't really ad networks. They're technology platforms that start their business model as an ad network by selling ads. This applies to a lot of the other industries. Uh, it's about buying something they have budgets and they don't really have questions about. <coughs> the other interesting one we're doing right now is borrowing an elephant. Okay, you're not an elephant. Elephants like to dance with elephants because everyone is big. But if, you, if you're not yet, then you can, you can get one to do this with you. So in our case, we have consulting firms, like uh, you know, the big ones. We, have, we actually have a partnership with Everest here in Portugal. Uh, we're firming uh, partnerships with the large ones in the US. Because then we're not gonna be selling to the banks. We're 
that's a target customer for us. They're not never gonna buy from us, but they will buy from Accenture, Deloitte, and Everest and all those. So all I have to do is make sure Everest and the other consulting firms are happy with me, and then they'll sell it for me. And that has been you know, successful somewhat. I mean, this is an early partnership. We haven't really signed anything yet in terms of sales, but I think it, it definitely opened a lot of the doors uh, for us. That also goes with media agencies. If anyone does anything in advertising, one way is to actually go with media agencies. I was telling you about the large telecommunication opportunities we had. I got there because of a media agency. The media agency had a problem. The problem was the client wanted to do this new revenue idea, they didn't know where to go, and they went to the media agency because the media agency had already solved problems like that, and they're a media agency, they must know what they're doing. What does the media agency do? They don't know what they're doing, so they hire other people to do the job. And as part of my network, someone said, look, I know someone in Portugal who can help you. So I went to the media agency, again, doing services, which I would never do, but in this case, I told them straight up front, I will go in, I'll do a two-day workshop with you, I'll tell you everything you need to know to tell your client. But in the end, you're gonna let me have two hours to pitch my product to you and get your feedback. And they said yes. So we did it, and in the end, then they proposed our solution to the client, the <coughs> solution. Again, no salespeople, we're just being the experts with the network to get to the large organization. And they were surprised, why are we hired? They were always asking themselves this in the calls that we were having. Why are we buying this from a startup in Portugal again? And no one knew the answer to that. But they, everyone knew it was the right decision that they were gonna make. Another good use of your institutional investors, if you have, is to do this same job. So, you know, having, you know, in Portugal, Portugal Ventures, um, Caixa, any other, you know, known organization as an investor, it really helps because they can be the lead <laughs> into other companies. Although we haven't used that too much, we did use as our business angels. They were very good at helping us out. And networking, I've sort of mentioned this everywhere. Uh, um, the one I haven't talked about is former colleagues. It helps a lot if you come from, or you have worked in large organizations before. H how many of you have worked in large organizations before the startup? Okay, that's very helpful, because then you know how people work, and you also contacted them, you know the network. That helps tremendously, and in my case, a lot, actually our advisors, um, and in fact, some of the angel investors were somewhat connected to previous roles I had. And that is extremely uh, useful. So is it all worth it? Because this is, this is long, right? This is a long time, a long... <coughs> well, it is, because once you do get them, they're very high margin. They're price insensitive, really. Unless you're five times more expensive than another alternative, which they don't have then it's gonna be with you. Uh, of course, this is just a generic rule, there's always uh, caveats here. They're long-term, they don't think about the next six months, they think about the next six years. So if usually, if you get in and you do a good job, you're gonna stay there. They're not gonna go through the whole process again, uh, unless they have to. They give you a tremendous reputation. You know, if you get big client, of course, everyone knows that. The problem we are having is we can't talk about them. And so we are out there, like, yeah, we have big clients, but we are under NDA, they did not let us talk about them. So if you can not have that, I'll really advise you to, because I've, I've been not been able to. And if you're thinking about your exit, having a large organization, many times they are the people who are gonna buy you. And if you wanna exit, uh, you know, sooner rather than later, they're very likely to be the person gonna buy you. Always think about that. Um, and we've, we've been through that as well. Um, and you can always sell more. So don't think that you're gonna sell the contract and the contract states everything you're ever gonna get. No, it's not. It never been with us, never been like that. Everything we've been careful with was stating that prices could be changed and that this was just for this particular part of the product or the process. And on average, year by year, we increase existing contracts by 20 to 50% in revenue. Not by selling them more, necessarily, but by saying that our product is now being refreshed, we have more features, and that was included, and you really need them, and so yes, the okay, budget goes up. And so yes, I think it is worth it, uh, but you have to think, do you have an alternative? If you do, start with that. Right. Now, 
that was the last of my slides. I don't have a final slide for some reason. But uh, before closing, I, I want to open up and ask you know questions that you guys have, experiences. I'd love to have your experiences as well. Yeah. Um, so when you started the company, you already started selling to elephants. If not, how long it took to make that shift? So we, we started selling to elephants uh, from day one, yes, uh, but not the products we have today. We started selling as consultants, so we were selling consulting hours. And so for them, it wasn't a big deal. Again, this is only a problem if they're buying something they don't know about. But they're buying consulting hours, you know, you're disposable, they're not, not a big deal. But that took us um, in for the first two or three years, and then we, able, we were able to convert some of that into a product sale <coughs> later on, okay? And then we always started selling to elephants because our products just don't work for smaller organizations. Does that answer your question? Anyone else? How do you generate leads? Well, the network, that's, that's number one. Our network of people that we help, that we mentor, that we provide free advice, are the generation are, are the source of eighty percent of our lead generation. They're the ones who throw contacts at us. And we just have to sort them out. Another one is just you're gonna laugh. It's the website. I, I just recently had one of the largest uh, telcos fill a form on the website like five days ago to say, hey, I want to hear more about what you guys are doing. So that is totally unexpected for me, but it does happen uh, as well. But the, the network is, is the most important thing. And even on the first call with this large organization that emailed us, they were trying to fish who we knew and who are we doing this with already. That's, uh, so it will come around eventually. The network is, is key. Do you like? Do you have any specific process so that you can be leveraging your network over time? We do, but I wouldn't say they're always the same or replicable. I think the process for me is, you know, there's a lot of pivoting in the company and product. Now we use for these kind of people, but we now we're thinking to change to these other ones. So number th one thing I do is always talk to the advisors while they're doing those small changes and ask their opinion. Because then, first, then they're aware the, of the change, they can give you feedback, and they, they hear about you, uh, from you again, right? So they, you know, every few months they know, they remember that you're there. These, when I say advisors, they're not necessarily just the ones that are in the advisory board. They're just people I, I remember, or I knew from before, or they're on LinkedIn, that I think are relevant for what I'm doing. So that could be someone in the media agency. So look, you know, if you're if I was in London, I'd say let's go grab a coffee. Unfortunately, I'm not there, but I'll go. I have. We're thinking about changing our product into this other direction. Can you give me your feedback? So that that has always just been the only process I know that needs to be always happen. Apart from that, I don't think it's any different from a, a, a sales process. You know, nurture, always trying to get back to them. But that's after you have the lead. But just to get the lead in the first place is keeping the network updated on what you're doing. And sometimes they may have better ideas. And they come back to me, oh, but actually, you need to think about attribution. So actually, there was a point where I was going out and talking to the same clients again, thinking, is attribution a problem for you? Is this something you think would be interesting that we pivot ourselves to? So that has always been sort of the process, if you like. Is that answer? Yeah. About consulting partners, yeah. uh, do you have any insights so that they actually are producing some sales for you? Like, do you know? Uh, it's, it's a bit early because our partnerships with them are recent, um, but we know that we've opened some doors because of them. Um, but we have not done any deals yet, as in firm deals. But I do really believe we will be um, very soon. They're, they're also a large organization. But, yeah, yeah they're, a very, they're a large organization as well. But they're not, we're not selling to them. We're helping them sell their stuff better, or we're helping them have a better offering to their clients. So it's a it's a different thing. It's a it's a sale, I guess, but it's not selling a product. It's telling them that they will be doing a better job if they have you as a vendor or as a partner, somewhat. And, and that conversation 
either it lands in, oh, we already have a relationship with Adobe or with IBM, and we don't want to ruin that. Okay, that's fine. But some, some other times it'll be, oh, uh, but there's this particular area that they don't do, and maybe you can help. And that's what we do. find a, a sponsor to find who's the person that has the most to gain in our organization with us and we try to get that job done by that person so push that that person uh, pushes everyone else in the organization so that that's like generic strategy that I have um, sometimes when it's about legal and we do do go through legal a lot um, then I try to do it differently I try to get them on a conversation about best practices and about what are they doing, what can I do to help, and just keep asking, what can I do to help make this faster? What can I do to help to minimize the risk you think you're taking? But that's, that's very specific to legal and privacy and security. Uh, but generally speaking, just get a sponsor. I get the person that has the most to gain, say, hey, you really need this? And they go, yes, I really do. Okay, so let's work together. You're working on your side, I'm working on my side to make that connection. I don't try to organize everyone on, on, on their side. I've never been able to do that. Um, what would you, your suggestion be for, for us, a startup that is selling tickets 10,000 euros, but uh, has some opportunities to go for, for larger deals, but don't want to lose the focus, but still want to try? It's a bit difficult because I would love to know a little bit more detail. On, on what is exactly the, the problems and the experiences so far. But generally speaking, if you're already selling to medium-sized organizations and you're successful, successful at doing that, just keep doing that. Because the elephants usually, if you go back, I don't really want to talk about their sales process because you know, that's just general knowledge. The, the, the main reason it would be an exit strategy still sell to the other medium-sized organizations because your exit, exit value is going to go up the more clients you have. Uh, and the more appetizing you're going to be, the more clients you have. So that, that's still the same story. But I think, if you think about the sales process those guys, not very large organizations go through, a lot of the times you spend on awareness and understanding if there's a real need. And if you are selling to those small organizations and you keep doing the communication that you're being very successful at doing that. And I know InfraSpeak is pretty good at doing that. Pushing out the message that someone else signed, someone else signed, even for the small ones. That's what gonna make the guys in the large organizations go from, oh, if everyone else is doing this, maybe I already need it. Let me dig deeper. And guess who they're gonna call anyway? You don't even have to go out and try and sell it to them. They're gonna come to you. Because you already now be positioned as the person who's now selling this to these other organizations. If I was going to be a little bit more tactical, and you really have a specific, because it's always about specifics. I don't talk about, large, I'm talking about large organizations in general, but in reality, we always think about a specific company. We never think about, I'm gonna to try to sell to large telcos, or large uh, IT companies. No, I wanna to sell to this one. And then it's a relentless effort to try to get in. I don't try to go to another one before I, understand that's not gonna happen. So it's always specific. So if you think about in that way, you can think about what are the smaller organizations that can sell first that are relatable to that bigger one. In the telcos, it's really hard because they're either big or they don't exist, uh, or they've been acquired like Portugal. Uh, and so trying to find indirect ways to get there, uh, but that might be a strategy, so think about you know, if, if, if they're in a specific industry, let's say, uh, 
uh, HR. So what are the medium-sized HR companies you can go out and sell to so that you have something to show to the larger one? It doesn't help selling to another kind of company. Maybe that's something that helps. Actually, uh, Clear. I do have a question uh, regarding so it's very common for for startups uh, to have like these mid-sized uh, customers, and then you have a process, a pipeline of this type of customers, and then you are closing, and then you are closing, and then you have a big guy coming to talk to you, and then suddenly instead of having 30 days trial and signing the end of the this, this 30 days, they give you a list of 250 things that we need to do to reply to this, uh, this case. So, on your opinion, uh, what I startup should do? So you, you believe should go after this or should say no? You should help them build the RFP. So the RFP, if someone doesn't know, RFP is a requirement, request for proposal. And that's one of the terms you learn if you sell it to large organizations. And this is what you're saying. The large organizations, they don't care what you have. They're gonna put up a list of 250 items that they've understood is what all the platforms that do what you do need to have. And so single sign-on, and where is it hosted, and blah, 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 and they'll go through that. What we try to do is get there before they even have an RFP and help them build the RFP. So I, I've done that before. I said, okay, I've received RFPs from different organizations. I'm gonna help you build the questions I'm gonna then later on answer. Of course, that doesn't always happen, but that is a valid strategy. And sometimes even replying to the RFP saying, hey, do you know that maybe there's a section in the RFP that you've missed? That might be important because I've seen it from other companies. Put it in. And that they always go, oh, really? Okay, thank you. They're like, oh, I'm glad I caught that because I'll be looking really bad if I had that. But answering your question more directly, you should, but be prepared it's not like anything else. They are not going to do what he said. Like they're not going to sign up after a thirty-day trial. That doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't even apply. But they will ask you specific questions. What I've learned is that a lot of the RFPs were actually a source of knowledge. We were now learning what they were seeing from our competitors that they care about, and so you know, putting that part of the roadmap now. So when I start to answer the questions, isn't just saying I don't have it. It's it's in the roadmap for Q4. And everyone knows what happens in Q4, it may happen in Q1 next year, or Q2, they don't care, but it's there. So our roadmap many times is strategically filled in with features that we saw coming in in RFPs that we don't have. Like single sign-on is a great example. We don't have single sign-on, but everyone asks for it. Have you tried Octa? Sorry? Have you tried Octa? It's like a pretty good uh, aggregator of single sign-on. Like and it's complicated because our stack is delivered on private clouds. It's mm. not a domain, it's in the client's domain. <coughs> bunch of reasons. It's complicated. Uh, if it was easy, it would have been done. But most importantly, it actually is never needed in the end. And, and, but it's in the roadmap because they ask for it. <laughs> yeah. I just want to point out that once you get your first elephant, it's usually easier to get the second one, the third one. And you may even want to to do like reference customer pricing, uh, yeah. which means that you will sell with a huge discount probably just to get the first name. Yeah. And uh, once you do that, it's easier to go uh, to look for the the rest of the herd. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. Uh, and uh, after the the first couple, you'll probably want to hear. Like, uh, why am I buying this out of uh, a Portuguese startup? Yeah, absolutely. And it's all about trust. All about trust. And anything you can do to raise trust in you helps. The best one is have another elephant in the room. Um, it may be a big client, that's the preferred. But once you're there, it doesn't matter anymore. You've, you've done it. You've, the, you, know, you were saying you've been able to replicate the sales process. So you could be here doing the same talk. It's absolutely. You know, You've done everything you could. So for me, this is all about before you even get there. Uh, because the way I see, and we spent a long time before we got the first sort of big company to sign up with us. Um, and so that's for this side of the journey. Afterwards, you don't even have an op a problem. Because trust is high, 
then it's about reputation, it's about rebuys. You know, I haven't even talked about rebuys, but rebuys are important. Are they gonna continue? And that's the best time, you've got to think, that's the best time to always renegotiate the prices. And you've got to be comfortable. Maybe they may throw you under the bin. They may say, I will not buy again from you because you're charging me more than you're charging another client. And you'll start having, you're going to start being a lawyer because you're going to be starting to ask, they're going to ask you for clauses in the contract with best preferred prices saying you cannot sell to them any higher than you sell to anyone else and other things like that. And it gets complicated. So a legal, a very good legal team at that point in time is also important. Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit about your customer acquisition costs? Because I think that will exclude a lot of people in the room. Well, like I said, I, it's hard to put a number. I don't actually have a, a final number in it. The reason is a lot of the work it's is, very expensive. A lot of the, no, a lot of the work is done free of charge. A lot of the work is done by helping other people, which in return refer us and puts us in, in a good word at the right at the right point at the right time. Because timing is very, very important. Uh, because everything takes so long, we've got to remember we've got to be in when you're in the buying mode. It doesn't matter, it, it may be you know, maybe one year off and you may have to wait a year before they're ready. And so you have to have the network pushing you in the right direction. At least that's what happened with us. So that sort of cost is sort of free. Well, you have your own personal time and company time to dedicate to also help other people, as well as maybe some equity or stock options that you may give out. But you know, if you start to hire consultant sales consultants, you're talking about you know for a couple of days a week, you're talking about minimum ten grand a month, minimum. So if you think one sales international salesperson at ten thousand a month trying to sell your stuff, if they come up with one or two clients, that's easily 30, 40 grand acquisition cost per client. That wouldn't be a bad guesstimate of what a real process would be requiring. And so selling it for anything under 100,000 is just crazy, it doesn't make any sense. But in return, you also don't think about the one year fee, you also think three year fees. How much are they gonna pay us for three years? Because even if the contract is one year, they're gonna be there for three years. Because the first year is, you know, the second is, okay, this is really well, is it working or not? And if it's not, then the third year is, let's make sure it really isn't working before we move away. <laughs> it's been our experience. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thank, Thank you very much for the 10 minutes in advance. <laughs>